Hey folks, this week we're joined by Mark Willis on the Pre-Rail Podcast. Mark is a three-time number one best-selling author. He's the owner of Lake Growth Financial Services out in Chicago. Uh, he's a certified financial planner, and the episode focuses on taking all of the, the hard earned money that we've made in the real estate industry and in the business over the years and putting it to work on the back end. Uh, he has a be your own banker philosophy uh, centered uh, significantly around whole life policy, something that I've personally invested in over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, it's a great episode. It really gives you some interesting exercises if you're going through that piece now where you're reanalyzing or analyzing for the first time the portfolio and you're looking to have the money on the back end work for you, uh, which is something I have not done uh, candidly to the extent that I should have. It was a refreshing and uh, as it was described, kind of a cold water splash to the face episode. Mark Willis, uh, owner of Lake Growth Financial Services, this week's episode, it's a great one folks, tune in. Are you ready to bring your real estate game to the next level? My name is James Prendamano. I'm the CEO and founder of Pre-Real. And over the past 25 years, I've closed over a billion dollars in transactional real estate. Each week, I'm meeting with outstanding investors, high-performing individuals, and visionaries operating in the real estate space. These are the people that are actually out there in the real estate game right now getting it done. This podcast aims at bringing anyone's game to the next level. This is the Pre-Real Podcast. We're joined by Mark Willis. He's the owner of Lake Growth Financial Services. He's a certified financial planner uh, who has a different approach and a different outlook on financial planning. Uh, heavy background in real estate. Very excited to have this chat today. We were talking offline a little bit. I'm going through this process now. It's not my favorite thing to do. So uh, I thought it was a great time to have Mark on the show. And with that, Mark, thank you so much for taking the time. James, glad to be on the show. Thank you. Yeah, look, you, you describe yourself as being a man on a mission to help you think differently about your, your money and your economy and your future. Um, what does that mean? Well, I think the biggest investment we can make is in our own thoughts. I believe that if you have a clear mind, singularity of purpose, you can succeed. I think most people have their financial lives sort of like a, a bag full of pebble rocks in their hand. They've been collecting these little bags of this little bag of rocks over their lifetime. They get their 401k because they feel felt like they're finally an adult. They got their first credit card through college. They got their Roth IRA because someone said it was cool. Someone told them to get into crypto, so they got some of that. And they got this little bag full of pebbles of rocks. And now they're trying to break through that glass window to get to success on the other side. So they take that pebble of bag full of pebble of rocks, throw it at the window and nothing happens. Why? Because the energy is dispersed. There's no focus. But if we have another rock in our hands, that's similar in weight to that bag of pebbles, we got one rock and we launch that thing at the glass window due to focus, we'll succeed. So yeah, when I say thinking differently with your money, your economy, your future, it starts with thinking. It's the three pound uh, knot of neurons in our heads that will make all the difference here. Now, don't get me wrong. We're going to get down to some strategic ideas, some tactics, some products, some approaches to the financial realm that uh, matters. We're going to take it way up the ladder and way down the ladder, hopefully on this episode. And certainly in my one-on-one -on -one conversations I have with clients, we work with folks all over the country real estate investors, business owners, even NFL Super Bowl champions, James, but most people I work with are just trying to have more control over their lives. Uh, and they feel like they're, um, I'd say most people would say, if they were to really speak honestly, they'd, they'd say, hey, Mark, I feel like I just walked into a movie 45 minutes late. This money thing feels like I don't know what's going on. Where, why did that guy just punch that other dude? Why did that guy just lower interest rates over there? I think most people just want the narrative. You know, tell me straight, how does this thing work? You're, you're talking about a number of different things here. So first off, um, you're describing someone that either understands or has a desire to understand the value of being intentional and being focused. Uh, as simple as that sounds, it's not. 
So is that part of your program or are you looking to work with individuals that have gone through that growth already? They understand what it means to be intentional. They understand how to focus uh, and they've got their mind set on now applying that focus to this piece of the portfolio. Uh, are you looking for that kind of seasoned investor and that seasoned person, if you will? Well, let's think about it in this way. One of the key conversations I have with clients, and we have a one-on-one -on -one advisory consultation with everyone we work with. And before I jump to any kind of products or strategies or conclusions, like a doctor, I want to make sure that this is going to be in your best interest. I am a fiduciary. I'm a certified financial planner. So that's a key piece to this puzzle. One of the conversations I have, and I don't care if they are a seasoned investor or just getting started, is what do you want your money doing for you? And it's a great thought experiment. In fact, it's free. You can do it right now. We could even have this conversation in five minutes or less right now, James. In fact, let's have a little fun do this. Let's do it. All right. So let's create a brand new financial vehicle. Poof, you got the magic wand. You're the Pope of money, you know? Wave the magic wand and poof, you got a brand new legal financial vehicle that can do anything you want it to do. What are the characteristics? What are the attributes that this new financial product or vehicle can do. And I'll, I'll get us started with one. How about this? Um, let's say it's tax-free. That's one characteristic. Tax-free when we get the money out. There's not a bunch of red tape or taxes or, or penalties to get the money out. Tax-free when we want to get the money. I'll pass the ball over to you. What's, what's another one? Yeah. So in, in my um, realm of the business, I want the money to be accessible from time to time, right? Because real estate is very non-linear in that regard. I want to be able to access the capital. I want the capital to work for me, not just work against me. Mm -hmm. I want the ability to access the capital in a reasonable manner that does not require like a full-blown examination every single time that you want to <laughs> unlock it, right? right. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of the impediments that we, we face. Um, I want the capital to be available based on uh, asset and portfolio value, not based on acquisition numbers. Uh, so much of what we do is predicated on finding undervalued real estate uh, as it is currently visioned. And we optimize the real estate in its current vision as step one. But step two is we revision the asset, right? Mm -hmm. Where others may look, uh, we're doing a deal right now. Um, it's a shopping center, 80,000 square feet. And uh, others saw a tired shopping center that had a lot of vacancies and it had uh, challenging leases um, and it had uh, really no laddering at all to the lease structure. Um, we saw an asset that outpositioned Walmart on the main drag. We saw an asset that had another 15 to 20,000 square feet of floor area available to expand the center. Uh, we saw an asset that had some new infrastructure improvements that were approved by the state about to basically dump all of the traffic from this main thoroughfare directly into our center. We saw the only neighborhood anchor, right? So it's let's reposition those 80,000 square feet. Let's fix the lease structure that's there. Let's find the right tenants, but then let's add another 25% of GLA to the asset, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the, the challenge is people will look at that asset and say, oh, well, you, you paid 2.7 million for it. Yeah, uh, but based on cash flow, when this is stabilized, it's worth 15, right? Yep. So- right. Bridging that gap, making yep. the capital available to execute that business plan, um, it becomes a challenge. So right. did I get too far yeah. on the what, for you there? What I, wanted, what I want to summarize from what you've said so well is you need access to cash for whatever you need, and you need the value of that asset where we're accessing it to grow and be accessible in a predictable way where you're yes. not being constrained on the growth because of some bank saying that you can only get, you know, the, you know, 90% of the acquisition value or something like that. Is that a fair summary of what you said so far? Spot on. Awesome, man. Yeah, that's, those are great. How about, um, I'll, I'll take one or two here. How about private, uh, where it cannot be accessed in a lawsuit if someone sues us. And uh, unfortunately, if we're in the real estate world, we're going to need that money off the radar of the courts. 
uh, again, we're just painting with a broad brush. We're just trying to be um, you know, wild and free here, man. No constraints, blue ocean thinking, right? Again, the thought is, the, the concept of this exercise is creative thoughts can lead us down a different path. If we only ever think the 401k or the self-directed IRA, we're going to be stuck in the dead end of our old neurons. So we need to be thinking outside that box. So privacy is another one. Uh, you, you mentioned collateralization. I think I heard you kind of get to that. I want to be able to use this asset as collateral for leveraging into other assets so I can multiply my wealth without it collateralizing against me or leveraging against me. I want it to only leverage in the right direction, not the wrong direction. As we all yeah. learn, leverage works in both ways. So how about any others? Any others that come to your mind? Sure. Uh, I, I would certainly want there to be reasonable interest rate controls. Yeah. Um, I would want there to be the ability to not, not approach it in such a linear way where real estate is, it, it, the markets always report in a lagging manner, but because we're on the ground, we see everything three quarters ahead of everybody, right? So uh, back in 2000, late 2005, early 2006, we had our weekly roundup with the team and, and you know, we were saying it's over. Like, you know, that's not what's being reported, but we saw the things that we saw and we knew this was done. Mm -hmm. So being able to take that vision and execute on what we know is happening, although it's not necessarily what they're saying uh, ahead of the curve. Right. Uh, so I don't know how you how you describe that, but a more malleable system that doesn't tie you to the confines of what's being reported today. Mm -hmm. uh, it allows you to trade off of the indicators that you see. Uh, if you pay attention, Mark, it's all there for you. Right. right? Yep. They, they have a way of convoluting the message. And, um, you know, candidly, folks don't have the tools. We're not given the financial literacy tools that. Uh, Kiyosaki's famous book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, so eloquently captured, um, you know, we're, we're kind of taught this in, we're, we're not taught it at all. And the elements that we are taught are completely counterintuitive. Right. So we want to be able to take that knowledge and take this, you know, uh, lifelong learner approach. And we're constantly adapting and we're constantly finding these emerging markets. We've been on the record for the better part of two decades being ahead of market trends. We want to leverage that now into financial vehicles that offer us the freedom to execute the business plan yeah. in real time. I'm hearing again, the immense need for um, freedom to access so that we can take advantage of opportunities. You know, banks are tremendously great at giving us money when we don't need it. Yep. And then they love to take it away right when we need it the most. You know, um, Mark Twain said, a banker is a fellow who will lend you his umbrella when the sun shines and wants it back as soon as it starts to rain. Yep. So what you're saying, again, I think is just important. Whether we use real estate or what, I mean, again, I like to get rid of all the nouns and just talk about the verbs. We've talked about access, tax-free, uh, collateralization, freedom of use. Uh, predictable growth. I'd also throw in there uh, guaranteed growth. Why not? Yeah. Right. Let's let's throw guarantees into this thing. Um, how about a legacy creating event? How about we talked about privacy? So as you can see, this could be a thought experiment that could last an hour, several days with folks. But we've just sort of scratched the surface. Most people go their whole lives and never even stop to think this one question through, which can be a breakthrough conversation for a lot of folks because. When they start to line up what their money is doing for them now, they look at their 401k. It's not tax-free. It's not guaranteed. There is no access to the money. You can't leave it as a legacy. It's not private. Basically, the exact opposite of everything we just said. Yeah. And I've talked to over a 1,000 families across this country. Almost all of them have a very similar list that you and I just compiled there. Now, why is it that most Americans have their money in things that are counter to everything they want? Now. That, that creates stress. That creates dissonance, right? When we act against our thinking, I do this all the time. I want a six pack of abs, but I also love ice cream. <laughs> so the, the key is waking up to our actions are acting against our beliefs. So if we want focus, if we want sanity in our financial lives, realigning our portfolios to match what we really want is crucial.
So that's the first step. We have that conversation. Then we get into some particular, we bring it down the ladder a little bit and we get into what, what is out there, what financial tools exist in the real world that are legal that can do everything we just talked about. And most folks think it's not possible. Um, I have found strategies that make all of what we just said totally possible in people's lives without it costing them, you know, a team of attorneys and an arm and a leg and legal fees. And, um, and it helps accelerate the real estate deals. Uh, and that's what I stumbled across myself. Uh, I was knee deep. I was probably eyeballs deep in student loan debt. When I graduated college, we had $120,000 of student loan debt. It was 2008, James. There was no plan for me to pay that off, which was the worst part of the whole problem. It wasn't the debt. It wasn't the recession. It was that I had no plan to pay it all off. And finally, I kind of woke up to it when they started calling me at dinner time, saying, you need to pay us. Uh, Cause back then folks still had to pay student loans off. <laughs> so we <laughs> go figure. So yeah. we, uh, we got onto it and we started doing the whole debt snowball thing, doing Dave Ramsey stuff, all that. And that was fine. That was good. But I started realizing a really empty feeling in my stomach uh, started to creep in. And I realized that I was losing the best dollars of my life. When you're, I was in my mid twenties, when you're 26, seven years old and you're throwing money into a hole that's also money you'll never see grow for you ever again. Yeah. And that's the most valuable dollar is the dollar you have right now in your pocket that you'll ever have again. So I, I stopped paying off the debts and I said, I need a better way to be debt free. I want to be more than debt free. And around that time, a mentor of mine, a professor from my college, he came and said, well, Mark, let me tell you about something called bank on yourself. And it was a strategy. He was just a professor. He had no skin in this game. He just, he wanted me to know about it. And it's a strategy, funny enough, of all things, uses a little known variation of a 200 year old asset called dividend paying whole life insurance. And I'd never heard, well, the little I had heard about whole life, I hated because Dave Ramsey told me to hate it. And I didn't know why I was just told to hate it. And so I did. Mm -hmm. so I was very skeptical when I first heard about this, but the more I dug into it, and the more I started reading on this, I was more and more compelled that this could be not only a strategy for me to pay off my debts, but could be the foundation of a financial tool portfolio for a lot of our, of our clients. So I started a financial firm, Lake Growth Financial Services, and we've helped clients, a thousand plus clients around the country set these up ever since. It's not all we do at our firm. Um, and and uh, before I jump into all the like why this tool was so compelling to me. Any any experience with whole life or ever seen it before? So my my biggest financial regret, and that's a pretty bold statement, is that I did not invest more heavily in my whole life policies 20 years ago. Um, I was turned on to them and I did invest what at the time felt like the maximum amount, right? Because to, to me, there was there was risk to it. If you if you miss the mark, you you kind of lose the whole pot. And I, I don't know how true that was or is or or, or is today, but I have over time uh, steadily increased them. But again, because there's not a um, a linear approach in real estate that allows you to access reliable income until you've arrived and you've got the cash flowing assets, but that that's taken a decade for me to put together. Mm -hmm. But during that time, it was a very scary proposition. And what prompted me into it uh, to, to double down onto it was in 2008, I thought I was positioned beautifully. I had a bunch of real estate that I owned debt-free. I had taken HELOCs out on them first position he locks, not second mm -hmm. and third, mes yep. debt, none of that garbage. And I thought I was going to have access to back then. It was a lot of money. It was a million two, a million three. And the banks shut them off. Mm. Zero balance. And wow. to me, that's when you do your damage, right? There was yeah. fire sales and there was all this opportunity. The banks shut them off, would not release the liens, even though they wouldn't lend on these HELOCs and I lost a whole cycle because I didn't build up my whole life policies at that point to a place where I could have accessed that cash. Mm. I didn't have a financial advisor that explained to me that you could actually pay 
the premiums from dividends once you get mm -hmm. to a certain point. I didn't know any of that. It, yeah. was a, it was an instrument that was brought to me and I was like, oh, that sounds good. When I'm 60, I'll have access to X amount of dollars and I could pull it out cash free, tax free right, rather. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But I didn't understand all the nuance of it. So it is my single biggest regret in mm. my financial planning world that I did not go heavier into that product. That's a, a an impressive statement. I hope everyone pauses and listens to that again and again, because that is a big statement. And I have honestly, I've heard people regret many things, their mutual funds they bought, their the house that they sold at the wrong time. I have never heard anyone say, Mark, I regret putting too much into my whole life. Never heard them say that. Too little. Yeah. Well, yeah, they, they usually say, right. I put I too little in. Yeah, yeah. They say, they say I, I didn't put enough in just like you did. And so for those that are not familiar with it, I'll quickly run down. It sounds like you've got quite a bit of experience with it. I'll quickly run down how this thing works, what it is and what it isn't, because it's not a good fit for everybody, um, is, is a dividend paying whole life insurance policy. Generally, we like to encourage folks to get it from a mutually owned insurance company. Usually we want it to have dividends uh, paying into the paid up additions. We also want to be able to add more policy premiums through paid up additions. We also wanted to have a non-direct recognition loan. All this vocabulary, you, you don't have to remember a piece of this. What I like to say is, what does it help us do? First of all, it grows on a guaranteed basis every single year outside of the stock market, outside of real estate market. Guaranteed growth usually keeps up with inflation, nothing crazy. It's going to improve as we go through higher inflation rates like we're going through right now. These policies will get better over time. Second, it's accessible money. Access for whatever we need. There's no required... Uh, forms to fill out. You don't have to get a credit check. You know, it's just your money. You have access to it. There's no prohibited transactions. It's your money. And there's no taxes due. If we've designed it properly, we can at least put it in so that there's no taxes due when we access the money. So it's like an unlimited Roth IRA in that regard. Third, it is life insurance. So we'll always leave our family more than we've saved in the contract. Again, guaranteed. That's just how insurance works. Uh, except for being a famous artist, I can't think of any other way to just automatically be uh, leaving my family a giant pile of money like that automatically when I pass away. And then finally, the uh, fourth is you can borrow against it. You can become your own source of financing. And before we hit record, James, I said the biggest specialization, if I have one, is helping people take back control of the banking function in their life. I believe that if you control the banking function in your life, you'll win. Whoever sits behind the banker's desk in your life is going to win the money game. I don't care what you made in your mutual funds last year. I don't care how your crypto is doing. If you're not in control of the banking function, then you will ultimately be under their thumb. But if you can sit behind the banker's desk, then you'll control the environment in which your money lives and you'll win by default. So you can borrow against the life insurance cash values. And if it's designed this way, this we call it bank on yourself for short. If it's designed the bank on yourself way, the policy will keep on earning interest and dividends as if you had not touched the money. So if I've got $100,000 of cash value, and let's say I borrow out 80 grand to go to go get a real estate deal, my policy will still earn interest on the full $100,000 as if I hadn't touched a dime of the money. Even on the capital I borrowed, it continues to grow. So to me, this overcomes opportunity cost. And it defeats the problem of always having to break compound growth to spend money. Now I can buy my asset and it still earns interest for me and my policy as if I hadn't, you know, used the cash. So at what point, Mark, is there a point where it's too late to start this process with whole life? Well, we just talked to a guy, he's 83 years young and he's getting started. Now, he is a different kind of caliber guy. He's a guy that knows that every day counts, and he's still in reasonably good health. But even if you're you know, 85, you can still be approved for the policy. Now, if folks have got some major health issues, we may not be able to get insurance on them, but they can still own the policy. I'll give you a quick story. I had a gentleman who had just had open heart surgery when I met him, but he loved this concept of bank on yourself. So we applied for life insurance on his wife and his adult children and his grandchildren. He's the owner of 12 policies. He owns all the cash in those policies. He uses them for borrowing and investing in his real estate. He has several rental properties. 
what he does is he's the owner, but he's not the insured. And when he passes away, he'll leave the policies as a gift to his spouse. So there's a, a, a process, and again, correct me if I'm wrong here, but there's a process of building up through the premiums this cash value, right? That, that you can access uh, when you need it. The process, as I understood it, took decades to get to a point where it was sizable, absent, of course, having the ability to just write the check for massive amounts out of the gate, which if you had that ability, this isn't as much of a need. So how do you bridge that gap? Well, some people, uh, first of all, the money in the policy is much more efficient than what you just described if it was engineered properly. You know, you can buy a Model T car, I'm sure, today somewhere. They'll still sell you one somewhere, or at least something from the 1970s that can get you from A to B, you know, an old, you know, clunker. Or you can get a super efficient, you know, sports car. Um, both are cars, just like both are whole life insurance. But if it's engineered the bank on yourself way, generally speaking, we'll cut the commissions and the insurance expenses down somewhere between 60 and 75% of the commissions are cut out of how we design these policies. That floods the policy with a lot more capital and cash on day one. I've seen policies that have zero cash value in the first year. Uh, and really the first several years, you can't touch the money. And it might take 20 years for it to break even, like you said. Generally, I just got off the phone with someone. I'm looking at his numbers right here. Uh, he's putting in $66,000 of premium in the first year. He'll have $43,000 of cash value right away and a $2.2 .2 million death benefit. Now that still cost him a little money, didn't it? it? Still cost him a little bit of money. But by year five, he's only putting he's he's putting in a little less every year, but he's now got over $300,000 in capital in year five. And all along the way, even in the first year, He'd still have $43,000 of money he could be accessing. And what could you do with 43 grand if you're just getting started? Maybe that's a down payment on a house. You know, even in the first 30 days of this policy, he's got a big bucket of money he can use. I always tell folks, though, this is not a get rich quick scheme. Uh, just if you need every last penny right now and don't want your money to grow in the future, just get a savings account, you know. But this guy, he's 34. By the time he stops funding it, he's 70 as he wants to. He could have stopped five, six years in, but he decided he wanted to fund this thing well into his 60s. By that point, he's got $4.5 million of cash value. $4.5 million. And his death benefits $8.1 million. Bucks. He's able to pull out at that point $230,000 a year of tax-free money for the next 25 years, which is way more than he paid in. And he still has a $600,000 death benefit when he passes away. And that is a very efficient way to just store wealth. Remember, this is just, this is not locking the money up. What I just described is, you know, just the policy itself. But James, what about all the rental properties he bought? What about all the syndication deals he did? Borrowing against this capital means he's able to do so much more than just saving money in a whole life policy. That's what so, it is, but it's not, it's, it's, it's more like a, um, a reserve for your opportunities and emergencies that you have in life. What was the cash value at 70? $4.5 million. So against essentially 2.4, $2.5 million investment uh, in yeah, cash. 2.2. 2. 2, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. He'll have 4.5 uh, of tax free as you pull the money out available at the age 70. Yep. And the death benefit on the policy was what? Well, at that point, it was $8.1 million, also income tax-free. And over his retirement years, <clears throat> from 71 to 95, he pulls out $230,000 a year, which my math here says that's a total withdrawn and enjoyed $5.75 million. Remember, he did put in, what was it, $2.2 .2 million? But he enjoyed 5.7 million, and he still has another 700 grand to leave his family when he's 95. Wow. Now, where was Wall Street with any of that? Incredible, wow. right? 
It, yeah, it that, is incredible. And that does not count the hopefully he buys 20 different syndication deals or rental properties or multifamilies or whatever else he wants to do with that money, which is not even being shown here. I view my policies less as an investment because they're not. They're just an insurance contract. But if we can design it as efficiently as I just described for that gentleman there, then it's more like a garage for our money. The, my car does not stay in my garage forever. I usually take it out and go go places with it. I'll go invest or I'll go on a family trip, but I'm always bringing my car back to my garage. And that's kind of how these policies are. They're regularly being used and then put the money back, use the money, put the money back. And uh, it, it brings a lot of sanity when we have that kind of focus with our cash. So if I could just bring that down here and kind of connect a little bit for the audience, the idea, folks, and the way that I've used the policy, not nearly to its potential, is if you're in real estate and you're you're putting this money away, you've got the death benefit, God forbid anything happens, but you get to year three, four, five, you have several hundred thousand dollars in this scenario that you're able to take out as cash. You use that money as a down payment. You get your traditional debt for the balance of the deal as you normally would. You execute the business plan. You either liquidate or through whatever liquidity event you refinance. You take that initial cash out. You put it back into your whole life policy. You own the asset or you own the uh, or you've taken the profits above your debt service when you have that liquidity event, and you either keep the cash flow or you pull that cash out and you go do the next deal. It is a remarkable vehicle. And as we're talking here, I'm wondering why I haven't gone back and revisited this and, and really leveraged these things um, in a much more efficient way. But you, it, it what, what people forget, I think, Mark, is time goes by real fast, man. And, you know, I've got some policies now for 24 or 25 years. And that money accumulates and you, you do wake up 10 years later and go, oh, you know, so when that 2008 instance happens or, you know, what we've gone through over the last couple of years and the banks are, are shutting the spigots off, you have, um, and it's, it's essentially unfettered access. My experience is I've put in requisitions within two or three days, you've got the money, you, there's no mm -hmm. sources and uses, there's none of that, it's your cash. The money comes, it goes in your bank as cash, it goes on your statement, you go execute your business deal, and you mm -hmm. do have freedom and access to that money. And it time goes by, boy, and it goes yep. by quick. Um, and I did a, a similar thing as my children were born. I started them with policies straight away. Awesome. Um, my wife has policy, but I, I, I have not uh, used this vehicle nearly to its potential. So is there an opportunity for folks that have some insurance in place already to move that portfolio over to someone that's a bit more of a free thinker like you are that's going to give? Uh, unfortunately, in the business, uh, you come against a lot of cookie cutter solutions and real estate is anything but cookie cutter. Right, right, right. Yep. So if I wanted to move my portfolio over, do you have the ability to do that? Or is it locked in from, from the initial investment? How does that work? Well, yeah, every person's different, of course. But to, yes, uh, to answer your question, we, uh, we regularly review people's existing life insurance at our firm. And if it's in great shape, we don't mess with it. But we'll still help give you advice, feedback, guidance on it. If we think we can help improve your situation, there's something known as a 1035 exchange, which probably sounds familiar to you. It's just like real estate 1031s, except it's life insurance. We just simply do a tax-free transfer from one company, one policy to the other. You get to keep all of your equity in the new contract on day one. And that money is now liquid and built properly uh, into a true bank on yourself designed policy. A lot of people have come to me and said, Mark, I think I might have one of these. You know, my agent, my guy, my gal, you know, uh, they set this up for me X years ago. And I'll look at it and it's, unfortunately, it's riddled with fees, commissions, might be tied to an increasing cost to it, like a universal life contract. I don't recommend uh, folks use universal life or variable life insurance for these particular uh, purposes. They have their own place, but they are not designed for banking. 
So yeah, if they're designed improperly, we'll do a 1035 exchange and get that money rolled into something more proper for them. Again, if it's in great shape though, we'll just, you know, we'll wish you the best or we'll service it, help you out, make sure that you're getting good guidance, you know, and, uh, and mentoring and strategic thought on how you can use your policies, whether it's with us or with someone else uh, for real estate or anything else. So I'm curious personally, was it the experience back in 2008 that set you down this path of, you know, financial services? Is that what you went to school for? Has that always been your passion or how did that come about? Yeah, it's a fun story and I'll keep it brief. Um, but I was actually going to school for something totally different. I was in, um, I was going through a master's of divinity degree, which is like theology and church leadership. I never thought I'd be like leading a big church. That wasn't really my calling. Uh, I just jokingly tell folks I, I really love the book of numbers. So I started getting into numbers after um, graduating. But it was actually the Great Recession that clued me in that money was a big missing piece to my own theology, but also just my life, man. I didn't know anything about this money stuff. I just didn't pay attention to it much. So I became financially conscious, I guess, when I graduated a master's degree. And you think that a master's degree, they'd finally get around to talking about budgeting or money management, but I never really had that experience, and I, or I'd never paid attention to it. They may have been teaching, but I just wasn't listening. So it was it was the pain of all that debt that got me clued in on this money thing, uh, which is a fine way to wake up, I suppose, if if you're being forced to wake up. A, a worldwide recession, unemployment, my personal unemployment, and all that debt was like a tornado of trouble that got me very much aware that I needed to pay attention to this money thing. And that's what got me focused. Now, I was working at the time for a CPA and the CPA was having those phone calls. Hey, Mr. Client, I know you're 63, but I've been putting your money in a, in the market for the last 25 years and you can't retire anymore. Yeah. Yikes. You know, I just lost you a third of your money. Yikes. I didn't want to ever have that call. And so I almost got out of the industry, the financial industry, until I stumbled across this strategy, which guaranteed that there would never be a lost year or lost decade for my clients or myself ever again, which is, you know, what we eventually coined uh, the, well, Pamela Yellen is the founder and, and she coined the phrase bank on yourself. But that's why I was able to, you know, really transition to that as our primary objective for clients is to make sure that they never took unnecessary risks. And they never gave, I never had to make that phone call to them saying, hey, man, I just lost you all this money. I never wanted to make that call. So that's sort of my story and how I came through from debt zone uh, to being a certified financial planner and working with clients all around the country. Could you could you talk a little bit, Mark, about that guarantee that you're talking about? You know, there was a period of time, long period of time, where Bear Stearns was a guarantee, right? Um, these These policies pay dividends based on what? What is the guarantee? What's the backstop? I think it'd be helpful if the audience understood that. Yeah, well, that's a great question. And Bear Stearns being one example, there was never a written guarantee contractual ob obligation for them to do anything. You know, they, they felt safe, but feelings aren't a contract. Uh, just ask any person who's dating somebody, unless they're married, there's no contract, right? <laughs> so, um, there is a contractual guarantee that your money will grow and increase in value every single year for as long as you have that contract. Now, folks say, well, Mark, how the heck is that possible? Uh, and what is ultimately guaranteed in life? I mean, I suppose if you really push me, nothing is ultimately guaranteed, right? There's nuclear war, whatever, we're all done, that's fine. Use your policy as firewood. But if it's, if it's a financial guarantee, from a unilateral contract, then we can't really get out of that guarantee. I mean, the insurance company that is can't get out of that guarantee. They wrote the contract. So how are they doing this? The best answer I can tell folks over a podcast, obviously we'd look at the numbers, but you want to make sure you're working with a company that's been around a long time and has been paying that guarantee. I generally only work with companies that have been around for over 100 years and have met their guarantees and obligations for that period of time and have thrown dividends on top of that guarantee. So the, the guarantee, and I'll keep this again as simple and as quick as I can, the guarantee is simply you getting a piece of your death benefit while you're still alive. 
the insurance company has this giant pool of money. Let's call it the pool. It's a general fund where they have to keep a lot of that money liquid, meaning like in cash, in case I croak today. In fact, if I've got a $50,000 cash value and a $500,000 death benefit, they need to keep something closer to that $500,000 in cash in case I croak today and give it to my family within a week or two. So far, does that make sense? Absolutely. All right. So if I don't die, and I'm hoping not to, by the way, if I don't die this year, I'm a year older. Now I'm a little bit more likely to croak next year. So they're going to give me a, a little bit more money, incentivizing me to go away. It's like a game of chicken with the insurance company. So instead of a $50,000 cash value, they're guaranteeing me $60,000, for example. That $60,000 represents my cash surrender value. If I was to surrender this thing and just walk away, instead of paying my family five hundred dollars they'd give me sixty dollars a day. So that's the incentive. They're raising the stakes. As long as I live, they're going to keep raising the stakes because they've got my death benefit on their books. It's a guarantee, right? It's not like they're they didn't find some magical unicorn bond out there paying some guaranteed interest. No, they, they've got my death benefit on the books. And if I live today and make it to my next birthday, they're going to increase my cash value on a guaranteed basis to, to eventually equal my death benefit by the time I'm you know 100 years old or 120 years old. So that's the guarantee. If they do better than the worst case scenario in their portfolio, bonds, mortgages, then they'll throw dividends on top of that guarantee. And uh, so hopefully I didn't confuse everybody, but that's sort of the inner machinations of how these policies grow. So they're essentially backstopped by companies uh, that you're, as a professional vetting, that have hit their dividends and hit their marks for 100 plus years. Um, I can tell you that was one of the big reservations for me. Um, and having been through three cycles now um, where, gosh, the market was rife with uncertainty and, and people missing the marks. Uh, I could say that, you know, knock on wood, right? Uh, yep. Our policies have endured unscathed and they have in fact hit their marks every time. So, well, I'll, I'll just add on to that. Yes. I think the, um, the, the piece is that's the, that's the, how they do it. But the, the why is they'd be out of business if they weren't keeping their guarantee. And you do want to work with companies that have significant third parties reviewing their books, auditing them regularly, check, being checked out and giving you A-plus ratings from Better Business Bureau, from AM Best, from Fitch, Standard & Poor, all the third-party rating agencies. Make sure you're doing your due diligence. Or you could just work with an advisor who specializes in this um, to pick the right companies for you, for sure. And that's um, obviously part of the diligence you're doing, right? You're, exactly. You're vetting mm -hmm. that out and making sure our money is going to the, the best bet. That's right. In, in 2008, there were, I think if I remember right, 437 banks that went bankrupt in 2008. 437 entire banks, not just the branch, the whole bank. Yep. No life insurance companies that were mutually owned went bankrupt in that year or the next year. Uh, there was one little company that wasn't mutually owned that went bankrupt. And the state insurance commissioner just stepped in and the company policy policies just went to another company. So instead yeah. of it being XYZ insurance, I think it was uh, Lincoln Memorial went out of business. One company instead of 437 and the one little company that went belly up, I wouldn't have worked with anyway because they were only around for 20 years. And you know they're not one of the companies I'd recommend to do bank on yourself. So you do, you're right. You do need to pick wisely or work with a bank on yourself professional like myself or one of my colleagues uh, to make sure we're picking the right company. So Mark, you're, you, you've got an extensive resume. You're a three-time number one best-selling author. You've got amazing content. Um, where, do, where do people start? You give the audience like the first steps. If they want to start taking control of their financial future, they want to start leveraging their, their money in, in the, the most appropriate and best way for them, um, often so many of us work so hard on getting to the point where you're actually acquiring the wealth that we fail miserably in putting it to work for us. If it's not a generational thing and you don't come from a lineage of um, this is the way it's done in the family, which we didn't, you know, many of us had very humble beginnings. 
we we don't have that pedigree. Um, where do we start, Mark? Where, where does someone, you know, literally, what what's the Adam and Eve moment? What do they do to get to a professional like you? Well, you know, thank you. And you're right. I think there is kind of a, wow, this is sort of a cold splash of water. How do we even get started with something like this? The very first thing to do is just to pause and think, what do I want my money doing for me? That's free. Takes you five minutes at least. Make that little list. Everything we've talked about can be done through a bank on yourself policy as I've designed it. The next thing you'd want to do is find an advisor, a bank on yourself professional. There are, there are 400,000 life insurance agents in the country, James. And as you know, not all of them, just like there are hundreds of thousands of real estate agents or whatever, you may not want to work with just any agent. Let's just say it that way. So finding a professional who knows this as their specialty and makes it part of what they do and incorporates it into the real estate portfolio that you want to have is so important. It's it's like, can, can't overemphasize. It's like getting into an elevator that wasn't engineered properly. You don't want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so reach out. I'd be happy to work with folks. I can help with this particular strategy. I think we're pretty good at it here at our firm. Uh, the best website is kickstartwithmark.com. That's kickstartwithmark, with a K, dot com. Uh, reach out and we'll do a 15-minute phone strategy session. It's free. We'll go through your conversations, your questions, see if this tool or other tools are a right fit for you. That's kickstartwithmark.com. Well, Mark, this was a, a wonderful episode. It's it's exactly what you described. It is kind of that cold water splash in the face um, moment that many of us need to work on the back end. You know, you get so busy working in the business, you often forget to work on the business, never mind working on the back end of the portfolio. Um, I really appreciate the time. This is, uh, again, folks, something that uh, I wish I spent more time and energy and did my diligence uh, earlier on in my career and, and really put a, a lot more intention and effort into this process. And it's something that I'm going through now. And I've kind of kicked the can down the road again because it's uh, not something that I'm very proficient in. It's not something that I understand well. Um, it's not my discipline, but that's why they've got the Mark Willis's of the world, right? So I really do appreciate it, uh, folks. I would encourage you and urge you to go through that exercise. Think about how you can put your money to work for you uh, in a, a far more uh, efficient way. The stack, the, 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 the deck is stacked against us. It always has been. Uh, but we live in a world and, and in an age now where through, through means like this, you can access uh, professionals, you can access information, and you really can take your portfolio and optimize it from top to bottom, not just the real estate, which is what we've specialized in, but the, the rewards from that real estate. You know, we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our families to, to complete that circle. Uh, Mark Willis, again, really appreciate the time. This was a, a great episode. Thank you. Thank you, James. Appreciate all the help. Absolutely. As always, everyone, please stay safe. 